Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we're continuing our discussion of coagulation drugs, and this is recording part two. Now we're going to talk about thrombolytic drugs, drugs that break down clot. Drugs like streptokinase, alteplase, tissue plasminogen acti activator, and so on. These drugs activate plasminogen, which is then turned into plasmin, and that destroys clots. When these drugs are given IV, that is systemically, there's obviously going to be risk of spontaneous bleeding, especially bleeding in the brain. This is especially true in patients who've had any sort of recent trauma or surgery. Most commonly, we see IV thrombolytics being given to patients with acute coronary syndrome or stroke. These are the clot-busting clot drugs that you may hear people talking about. They can also be given through a clogged vascular access device, like a dialysis catheter or a PICC line, in hopes of opening up the clot that's blocking that device. You could also give them directly to the clot through some sort of interventional radiology or neuroangio procedure. Then the dose would be much lower and the systemic side effects would be greatly reduced. Now we're going to talk about antiplatelet drugs, and aspirin is the model for, this dr for these drugs. Aspirin is an NSAID, as we will discuss later on in this semester. It, can, it inhibits both COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes. It causes irreversible prevention of platelet aggregation and is used to prevent stroke, myocardial infarction, and occlusion of coronary stents. In high-risk patients who have coronary stents or um, severe, I wrote several, but that should be severe coronary or neurovascular disease, we recommend that they continue aspirin throughout the perioperative period. Uh, and the exception is really for surgery on closed spaces like the skull or the spine or the posterior eye in which case you would stop at five to seven days before surgery. We always have to consider the risk of bleeding versus the risk of stopping the drug. Other antiplatelet drugs would be drugs like Plavix, which is clopidogrel, also ticlopidine, ticlopidine, prasugrel, and ticagrelor. These are all irreversible except the Brulinta, which is reversible. Inhibition of platelet activ activation and aggravation. And again, these are used mostly in patients with coronary stents, especially together with aspirin. And they, they'll call this DAPT, dual antiplatelet therapy. These drugs are usually stopped five to 10 days before surgery. And even in patients with stents for whom you would continue aspirin indefinitely, you might choose to stop the Plavix in advance of surgery. Certainly we don't do any regional anesthesia during this time because of the risk of bleeding. And in a true emergency where you wanted to reverse these drugs quickly, you might consider giving a platelet transfusion or doing some studies to look at the platelet function. The biggest side effect, of course, is bleeding. Now let's talk about some other anticoagulant drugs. And there's quite a number of them. They can be hard to keep track of. So this is a good reference for you to be able to refer to. Direct thrombin inhibitors are drugs like Argatraban, Dabigatran, which is Pradaxa, and bivalirudin, which is Angiomax. These are very specific thrombin inhibitors, and they also have some effect suppressing platelet function. They can be used as alternatives to heparin in patients who have HIT, and therefore can be used to cause enough blood thinning to go on to cardiopulmonary bypass or ECMO. They can also be used in treatment of acute coronary syndromes. These can be titrated based on PTT levels, and in case of overdose, we suspect that they could probably be reversed with PCCs. The direct factor 10A inhibitors include Xarelto, Eliquis, Bevixa, and Seveza. Again, drugs that you may not commonly be familiar with, and this should serve as a good reference for you. All these drugs have XA in the name. Rivaroxaban, Apixaban, Batrixaban, Edoxaban. The XA reminds us that they are factor 10A inhibitors. These drugs all have short half-lives and rapid onset of action, making monitoring unnecessary. They also have very few dietary interactions compared with, say, Coumadin, which has many interactions due to the vitamin K. These drugs are approved for use in patients who have HIT. They can probably be reversed with modified recombinant factor 10A, this drug is under the brand name Andexa, and we'll talk about that in a few slides. This binds to factor 10A inhibitors and neutralizes them. And they may also be reversible with PCCs. 
the indirect factor 10a inhibitors the one most commonly seen is fondaparinux also called erixtra is a drug that mimics the active binding site of heparin when it binds to antithrombin 3 it inhibits factor 10a indirectly but does not inhibit thrombin these anticoagulant drugs have a very low risk of hit and may be useful as an alternative for both prophylaxis and treatment of DVTs and PEs. There are no clear guidelines regarding regional anesthesia in patients taking these drugs. Probably you should wait at least 24 to 48 hours before proceeding with regional anesthesia. They are renally excreted and may also be reversed with the modified recombinant factor 10A and DEXA which again binds to the factor 10A inhibitors and neutralizes them. The indirect factor 10A inhibitors may also be reversible with factor 7A. Now we're going to switch gears to antifibrinolytic drugs. These are drugs that are used to decrease bleeding, especially intra and post-operative bleeding, and they've been used in a wide variety of clinical settings, cardiac and liver surgery, transplants, orthopedic surgery, pelvic surgery, OB, cranial facial surgeries. They work by forming a reversible complex with plasminogen, and therefore they prevent plasmin from being activated. And if there is plasmin, sometimes they even inactivate it. The way I think of these drugs is they prevent fibrinolysis and they stabilize clot. Obviously, the risk of using these drugs is that you can get thrombosis in patients, and so they can have strokes, heart attacks, and things like that. The two drugs you're most likely to see are Epsilon aminocaproic acid, which is amicar, and tranexamic acid. These are drugs that protect, protect clot by preventing plasminogen being converted to plasmin. Side effects may be myalgias or nausea. There was another drug, drug called aprotonin. It's largely off the market now because of its thrombotic risks, and patients were having MI as well as renal failure. For example, at our hospital, we use tranexamic acid during joint surgery. We give 10 milligrams per kilogram bolus up to one gram. We give it after induction or um, if we do a spinal after the patient's positioned for their spine, after the patient's positioned for their surgery uh, before incision. And we give it over about 10 to 15 minutes and repeat it three hours later unless they have an elevated creatinine. Patients who probably should not get tranexamic acid would be those who have a known prior clot like a DVT or a PE an MI or coronary disease, a stroke, atrial fibrillation that requires anticoagulation, and other such conditions. We also try not to use it in patients who've had a seizure or other problems with microcirculation, like in the retina. Recombinant factor 7A is a drug that directly activates factor 10, and by doing that, it initiates the thrombin burst. You don't need factor 8 or factor 9. It just goes straight to initiate the thrombin burst. It does require some, platelet, some presence of factors 5, 10, and 2. You need to have fibrinogen and some platelets. Officially, this drug was used for treatment of hemophilia A or B. But many places are using it as their hemostatic agent of last resort in traumas, hepatic failures, GI bleeds, OB hemorrhages, intracranial hemorrhages, in some transplants. People used to try using it for reversing warfarin, but we don't recommend that anymore because we have alternatives that are better. The dose of recombinant 7A in these situations is unclear. Obviously, the more we give, the more risk there is for clotting. And trading off uncontrolled bleeding for uncontrolled clotting can be just as catastrophic for our patients. A lot of people suggest starting with 20 to 40 mics per kilogram, maybe 40 to 90 if it's more urgent. Some suggest the maximum is 200 mics per kilogram. Just as a point of reference for hemophilia, the normal dose is 90 mics per kilogram. It has a half-life of two, hour, two hours, and it costs $1 per microgram. So we're easily getting into thousands and thousands of dollars of treatment with every dose, which needs to be redosed every couple hours. As we said, thrombotic complications are a big concern, and we really want to consider avoiding this drug, if at all possible, in patients who have coronary disease, cerebrovascular disease, if they have devices that could become clotted. The prothrombin complex concentrates, or PCCs, were originally FDA approved for the treatment of hemophilia A and B.
This was important because it replaced factor 7A as the drug of choice for emergent reversal of vitamin K antagonists like Coumadin and for management of critical bleeding in all sorts of uh, situations including surgery, trauma, and liver failure. The PCCs were preferable to factor 7A because there were fewer reports of significant thrombotic complications. Also, compared to FFP, much less risk of infection. The PCCs contain factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. Note that factors 2 and 10 have half-lives of 60 and 30 hours, respectively, making them uh, much longer acting than factor 7A. In fact, some recommend that you should check a thromboelastogram before redosing PCCs. The two kinds of PCC you may find available, the first is K-Centra. It contains factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, as well as proteins C and S. It's dosed at 25 to 50 units per kilogram IV at a rate of 3 units per kilogram per minute. You may also see factor 8 inhibitor bypass agent, FEIBA, which is an activated factor 7. This means that it contains factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, but the factor 7 is 7A, activated factor 7. Because it's activated, it may increase the thrombotic risk, as we discussed earlier. The recommended dose is 50 to 100 units per kilogram every 6 to 12 hours. As with many other reversal agents, PCCs may be contraindicated in patients who are in DIC or who have a high risk of thrombosis or severe complication from thrombosis. Another newer drug that's available is modified recombinant factor 10A under the brand name Andexa. This drug binds to both direct and indirect factor 10A inhibitors and it neutralizes them. It may also be used to help re reverse anoxaparin, Lovenox, which as we saw before has some anti-factor 10 anti-factor 10A activity. This is an off-label use of the drug, but still may come in handy in urgent situations. There are two regimens recommended, and we won't go into all the details here except to say the low-dose re regimen is a 400 milligram IV bolus and then an infusion of 4 milligrams per minute. The high-dose regimen is 800 milligram IV bolus and then run the infusion at 8 milligrams per minute, and this depends on the degree of factor 10A activity. This drug is very expensive. Desmopressin, or DDAVP, is a substance that causes release of factor 8, von Willebrand's factor, and TPA. We do see tachyphylaxis with repeat dosing of this drug. Its main use is in patients with von Willebrand's disease. All forms of von Willebrand's disease respond to this, except for type 2b, where you can actually worsen their situation. You may also find benefit for desmopressin in patients who have mild hemophilia, uremic platelet dysfunction, especially in renal disease, and patients who are taking antiplatelet drugs, including aspirin, NSAIDs, Dextran, or Plavix. Now the DDAVP, the V stands for vasopressin, but the activity of desmopressin is only at the V2 vasopressin receptors. So we don't see the vasoconstriction or the hypertensive response that we see with vasopressin. We only see the antidiuresis effect. The dose is typically 0.3 micrograms per kilogram with an effect lasting six to eight hours. One last substance I'd like to discuss before we wrap up is fibrinogen concentrate, also called Reastap. This is concentrated lyophilized protein that you could give instead of giving cryoprecipitate in, in order to administer fibrinogen to your patient. It has between 900 and 1300 milligrams of fibrinogen per 50 milliliters, so it's got a concentration of about 20 milligrams per milliliter. It's made from pooled human plasma. It's easily stored and easily reconstituted, 
and allows you to have a very low infusion volume in order to administer a significant amount of fibrinogen. It also reduces exposure to infectious agents compared with using regular cryoprecipitate. Typical dose is 70 milligrams per kilogram if you don't know the patient's fibrinogen level. There's also a formula you can use if you have a measured fibrinogen. We give about five milliliters per minute and it has an af a half-life of 80 hours. We will stop here. Please let me know if you have any questions and we will look forward to discussing this with you in class.